Hi, engineers. In this video, we're going to talk about smooth muscle, specifically the different types of smooth muscle and how it's contracting and how it's relaxing. Let's dive right in. So first off, what we're going to look at here is we're looking at a huge, I'm just taking and blowing up one big smooth muscle cell. I'm blowing that sucker up so we can see inside of it and all these mechanisms that are occurring inside. We're going to get to this last because this is going to be a lot of stuff. So hang in there, okay? Now, what I want to do first is I want to talk about a couple characteristics of smooth muscle, the types of smooth muscle, and how it's actually controlled. You know, some of it's actually on its own intrinsic activity, some of it's controlled by the autonomic nervous system, some are controlled by hormones and chemical factors. We'll talk about all that. First thing I want to do is I want to take a look at one smooth muscle cell. So first thing about smooth muscle that I want you guys to remember, I'm going to write it down, is that smooth muscle is not striated. You have to remember that. Smooth muscle is not striated. So first thing, right away, not striated. First off, the question at hand is what is striation? If you guys watch the skeletal muscle videos, you've probably heard of a term called the sarcomere. Remember the sarcomere was consisting of the Z discs, the thick filament which is consisting of the myosin, the thin filaments which had the actin, the tropomyosin, the troponin, all that different structure that was setting up a nice, nice sh striped structure is called the sarcomere, right? And that was what's making that striped appearance. In smooth muscle, they do not have a sarcomere. Okay, that's one thing. Instead, their myofilaments or their protein filaments are arranged in a different type of way. Let's take a look at that real quick and go over some of the actual microscopic anatomy of this actual smooth muscle cell. Because all of the other smooth muscle cells are going to be the same. So first things first, smooth muscle is generally uninucleated. Okay, so that's the first thing. So let's write that here first. It's generally uninucleated, meaning that it only has one nucleus. Whereas skeletal muscle, if you guys remember, it's multinucleated. Cardiac is usually uninucleated also. Next thing, this red structure here is representing the plasma membrane or the sarcolemma, right? The next thing is this green structure. You see all these green dots all over the actual smooth muscle cell? These green dots are special, special structures called dense bodies. And dense bodies are made of a protein primarily called alpha actinin. Alpha actinin is the primary protein that's making up these dense bodies. So these dense bodies are scattered all throughout the actual smooth muscle cell. What's important is that these dense bodies are anchored to the plasma membrane by these pink proteins. These pink proteins are basically anchoring, look, this, this actual right here is anchoring the actual dense bodies to the actual smooth muscle cell membrane. And there's many proteins that are making up that structure. But basically what it's doing is there's these like attachment plaques, these integrin proteins that are actually on the inner uh, cytosolic side of the smooth muscle cell. And these attachment plaques, these attachment plaques are basically what these dense bodies are connecting to. Okay? The other thing that's really, really important is these orange proteins. You see these orange proteins here? It's connecting that dense body to that, to that dense body, connecting that dense body to that, to that dense body, and it's connecting that dense body to that dense body. It's basically what it's doing is it's connecting the dense bodies to one another. What is that orange protein called? That orange protein is actually your intermediate filament. So what is this orange protein here called? It is your intermediate filaments. And it is composed, uh, composed of two primary proteins. One is actually called vimentin, and the other one is called desmin. Okay, so so far again we have smooth muscle cell membrane, which is the sarcolemma, plasma membrane, uninucleated, dense bodies consisting of alpha actinin. The dense bodies are uh, anchored to these attachment plaques, which are just basically integrins on the smooth muscle cell membrane via these myofilaments. The dense bodies are anchored to one another through these intermediate filaments made of vimentin and desmin. And here's the good stuff. If you look here, these dense bodies coming off of them, they have these little baby blue filaments coming off. These baby blue filaments are actually called your thin filaments. It's called your thin filaments, and it's made up of two proteins. One is it's going to be actin, primarily that of F-actin. And the other one is actually going to be tropomyosin. Okay, so on the thin filaments, the thin filaments are going to be consisting of a protein called actin and tropomyosin. Then you're going to see in between interdigitating. So if imagine here, if I have my fingers 
here's my fingers are the actual actin. In between these actual digitations is going to be your thick filament, this red line. That red line structure is actually called the thick filament. So again, what is this red structure right here interdigitating between these thin filaments? That is your thick filament. And the thick filament is important because it's actually composed of the primary molecule called myosin. Technically, it's actually type 2. Okay, and we've talked about myosin plenty in the actual skeletal muscle. So again, why is this important? Well, whenever, it different from skeletal muscle, because when skeletal muscle contracts, it basically causes the muscle to shorten, right? By moving the thin filaments closer to one another, sliding those myofilaments over. Same thing happens, but instead, the dense bodies are acting like your Z discs. And whenever this dense body, whenever your muscle contracts, it pulls this dense body right here to this dense body right here and causes these to shorten. But when that one does it, same thing happens right here. This shortens, this shortens, this shortens. And not only that, but these actual intermediate filaments made of vimentin and desmin are also pulling the actual dense bodies closer together. So afterwards, your smooth muscle will actually kind of twist and squeeze itself together. And it'll kind of make like an actual corkshoe type of like shape, right? So imagine here's that smooth muscle, and then we decide to like squeeze it and basically, like imagine it like this. And now imagine just, I'm gonna draw all of these just random, but imagine here is all of these actual dense bodies and thin filaments and thick filaments. It's basically squeezing that smooth muscle cell in like a corkscrew-like action, okay? All right, so that's the microscopic anatomy of the smooth muscle cell. Next thing we need to talk about, so we know that smooth muscle cell is not striated, and we know why, because it doesn't have a sarcomere, it has all of this actual protein structure. Next thing we know is we need to know the types of smooth muscle. So there's two types of smooth muscle. One is actually called unitary smooth muscle. They also can call it single unit, not smooth muscle, smooth muscle. Smooth muscle. This is actually also called visceral muscle. So this is also called visceral smooth muscle because this is primarily where you're going to find this type of muscle. The other one is going to be multi-unit smooth muscle. Multi-unit smooth muscle. All right, sweet deal. Now, what's the difference between these two? Well, one thing that you're probably already going to get out of this is that unitary is also called visceral smooth muscle. So where would you find it? You'd find this within the GI tract. You'd find it within the urogenital tract. So that's the first thing. So let's mark that out. Where would the location, where would you find this type of smooth muscle? Again, you'd find it within the entire length of the gastrointestinal tract. You'd also find it within the actual urogenital tract. Okay? So pretty cool stuff there. Now the multi-unit smooth muscle, where would you find that one? This one is primarily located in a couple different places, and we'll talk about why they're found in different places because it's obviously due to their function. This one is primarily found within like the iris, so specifically, you know how you have the iris, you have the pupillae sphincter and you have the dilator pupillae, right? So the, the actual iris has the dilator and the constrictor pupillae. So the constrictor pupillae. These muscles are actually a specific type of multi-unit smooth muscle. Another type is actually going to be the bronchial smooth muscle. So the bronchial smooth muscle is also multi-unit smooth muscle. The tunica media, which is inside of our actual large vessels, so inside of our large arteries, large arteries, very, very thick tunica media layer within the large arteries. And you can also find this within another part of the eye, which is called the ciliary muscles, which control the actual lens, so they control the lens, the accommodation action. And you can even find these suckers in the erector pili muscle, which basically gives you the goosebumps. This is the goosebump muscle, all right? All right, sweet deal. So we know where we'd find this one. Now, why will we find it in this one? The next thing we need to understand is that these unitary smooth muscles are actually interconnected with one another. They're interconnected with one another, especially through these specialized structures called gap junctions. And gap junctions just basically connects in subunits. And let's say that, ooh, another thing, it's actually innervated by the autonomic nervous system. Most of our actual smooth muscle is innervated by the autonomic nervous system. It can be affected by hormones and other chemical factors, like we said. But generally, autonomic nervous system via the parasympathetic nervous system or the sympathetic nervous system 
has effects on this actual smooth muscle. And it has, you see these little balls right there, those little blue balls that I drew right there? Let's say I expand in on one of these. This is actually consisting of multiple different types of neurotransmitters. These blue bulbs, which are basically these synaptic vesicles, are consisting of various neurotransmitters, and they call this bulb of various neurotransmitters, they call it a varicosity. Okay, a varicosity. And varicosities consist of many neurotransmitters. For example, you could release norepinephrine. It could release acetylcholine. It could release noro, um, I'm sorry, nitric oxide. You could release adenosine. It could release substance P. Many different chemicals. We're not going to go over all the chemicals, but it can release many different chemicals from these varicosities. And they can act on the smooth muscle. Okay, so again, it can be innervated by the autonomic nervous system, both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic, as well as hormones and other chemical factors. Here's the crucial thing. Let's say that these neurotransmitters are released from these varicosities. So let's say that these varicosities are releasing chemicals and it's stimulating these smooth muscle cells right here. What's cool is if it only stimulates these smooth muscle cells, you'd be like, oh wait, well only, only those ones are gonna contract. No, they have these electrically coupled gap junctions that allow for ions to flow from this cell to this cell to this cell. So let's say this is one cell, two cell, three cell. I can have these cations flow in from this cell into this cell, stimulating that cell, and then flow in from the second cell to the third cell, stimulating this one. Then look, it can flow over into the fourth cell and stimulate this bad boy. Flow over here to the fifth cell and stimulate this bad boy. And it can also flow into the sixth cell, but this is already getting stimulated, but you get the point. All of these are electrically coupled together. So they're electrically coupled together. So because of that, they can generate a rhythmic and sensational contraction. So they can generate a rhythmic, simultaneous contraction. It's pretty sweet, right? Yeah. Another thing is because this is actually going to be in the GI tract and the urogenital tract, this isn't really for very fine tuning activity, which is like within the iris and the bronchial smooth muscle and all these other structures. Those are for like really, you know what, there's the difference between gross control and um, fine control. So like for example, and I'm applying this to more of like a, a larger concept and then we're gonna apply it to the smooth muscle. Gross control is like me moving a whole arm. Okay, it's me moving a whole arm or picking something up, utilizing a lot of that, that action right there. If I decide to, watch this, I take and I pick up this pen. I picked up the marker. I use very, very fine control. So fine control is like very, very small movements, whereas gross control is very, very large and powerful movements. This is meant for very, very gross control, heavy, powerful movements. So let's write that here. So this is for gross control, which is just heavy, powerful movements. Now, with this one, look at these suckers. They're all separated from one another. There's no gap junctions connecting these guys. So they, each one of them have their own stimulatory neuron. So because each one of them have their own stimulatory, or it doesn't always have to be stimulatory, remember that, it could obviously be inhibitory, but we're talking about it with a sense of stimulation. Again, all of these neurons have their own nerve ending. This has its 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 own nerve ending. They're not electrically coupled together, so they don't really work in a syncytial-like action. They're not really gonna develop a rhythmic contraction. They are uh, structurally independent of one another. So let's write that there. They are structurally independent. All right. So this one you would actually see, because they have so much nerve endings, they're actually gonna be very excitable. So these are more for the concept of fine control, very, very fine controlled activity, okay? All right, so sweet deal. So we, now we understand that. So that's the difference between unitary smooth muscle and multi-unit smooth muscle. One more thing I said is that our smooth muscle is generally controlled by the autonomic nervous system, right? Whereas, if you guys remember from the skeletal muscle, which is controlled by the somatic nervous system. So let's compare the two there quick. Autonomic nervous system, it's composed of the parasympathetic nervous system, and it's composed of the sympathetic nervous system. I'm putting SNS for sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system for PSNS. These are going to directly control the actual smooth muscle. They control smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, so smooth and cardiac. But the key thing is, is that this is all involuntary. We do not have any conscious control over this. Some people might have the ability to do it through biofeedback techniques, but we're talking about this in general. 
The somatic nervous system is what's controlling the actual skeletal muscle. And this is actually going to be voluntary. So I just want you guys to understand the difference between the smooth muscle as compared to the, uh, the actual skeletal muscle. All right, now we've done that. Okay, now what I wanna do is, I wanna look at a smooth muscle cell and I wanna see how we can actually stimulate the smooth, smooth muscle cell through various different types of stimulation as well as intrinsic stimulation. And that's gonna be pretty cool to see. And then we're gonna see all the mechanisms that are occurring intracellularly and then we're gonna see the contraction process and then we're gonna see the relaxation process. Okay, so let's start there first. The first thing I wanna do that, I wanna make a graph. Let me make a graph real quick here. Small graph, doesn't have to be a really big one. I'm just gonna put this one right here. Okay, and what this graph here is going to represent is I'm going to have a resting membrane potential, we'll denote that as RMP, and that's going to be approximately around negative 55 millivolts. I'm sorry, not negative 55. That's a wacko move there. It should be negative 80 millivolts about. Okay? And then let's say that they have a threshold potential. And that threshold potential, which I'm going to denote as TP, let's say that's around negative 55 millivolts. Okay? And then they have a peak potential. But we'll talk about that. What's really cool about this is that certain smooth muscle cells, primarily that of the unitary or the visceral smooth muscle, which is in like your stomach and your small intestine and large intestine, they have this really cool like rhythmic pacemaker-like activity. There are specific cells, and these cells are called the interstitial cells of Cajal or Cajal, however the heck you say his name. Either way, these are your pacemaker cells. Okay, so these are your pacemaker cells. What does that mean to be a pacemaker? It means it can intrinsically depolarize dependent of any extrinsic innervation, like the nervous system. How do they do that? This is so cool. Let's do this one in a pink here. What can happen is, look at this. It has, here's a resting memory potential. It can actually produce these things called slow waves. And these slow waves can get pretty darn close to threshold potential and sometimes actually break threshold potential. What are these little slow waves due to? Because generally a smooth muscle cell has a resting membrane potential that's pretty, pretty stable. And then it, based upon a stimulation, it'll rise. This can do it on its own. These little pink up and down waves are due to two things. Inside of this smooth muscle cell, in certain smooth muscle cells, we're gonna talk about pacemaker cells. They have these specialized uh, stretched like calcium channels. So look up here at the top here. We have the stretch sensitive calcium channels. I'm sorry, I'm not, I shouldn't say stretch sensitive, I should just say leaky. Let's just say leaky, leaky calcium channels, leaky calcium channels. So in other words, they're kind of like always open. What are these leaky calcium channels doing? They're constantly staying a little bit open, enough for calcium to actually rush into the cell. Not excessive, but very, very slowly. A very, very slow flow of calcium into the cell. If calcium is constantly flowing into the cell, what are we bringing into the cell? We're bringing positive ions into the cell. As we start bringing positive ions into the cell, what starts happening to the membrane potential? it starts becoming more positive. What did you see that from? Let's come back down, look. It was right from this part. So this rising part of the slow wave is actually due to calcium ions. And again, what, are the, what do we call these? These things right here, where you go up and down, up and down, very, very slowly is called slow waves. It's basically the basic electrical rhythm. And again, what are these slow waves due to? They're due to these calcium channels that are constantly leaking and allowing for a little bit of calcium to come in. Well, why does it go back down? Well, because potassium channels open. So then what happens is potassium channels will open whenever it goes up and it doesn't hit the threshold. So let's say that it goes up, doesn't hit the threshold. So it goes up, doesn't hit that dotted line, and it goes back down. What would that be due to? It would be because on the membrane, you're gonna have these potassium channels, these leaky potassium channels. And these potassium channels are going to keep flowing out of the cell until they reach their equilibrium or inert potential. And if positive ions are going out of the cell, then the inside of the cell will become more negative. And as it tries to become more negative, 
it brings the resting membrane, I'm sorry, the, the actual membrane potential back down to rest, okay, if we don't reach threshold. But let's say some chance that actual slow wave breaks threshold just enough. So let's show that it breaks threshold just enough. Those calcium channels are open up long enough to break the threshold point. If it breaks the threshold point, look what happens here. Let's do this in this blue color. You get these things here where you just break the threshold potential. Boom, look at this. You produce these things called spike potentials. So you produce these things called spike potentials, which are basically action potentials. These are basically action potentials. And what do they do to? Okay, so let's say that you hit the threshold potential. If you hit the threshold potential, these right here are called voltage gated calcium channels. And these voltage gated calcium channels are usually located in these little divots. You know our actual smooth muscle cells are different from the skeletal muscle? Skeletal muscle has the T-tubules. Instead of that, we have these things called calveoli. They're just these tiny little, kind of like little divots. And inside of those divots, we're going to have those voltage-gated calcium channels. So all I'm doing right now is I'm zooming in on one of these voltage-gated calcium channels. These little channels, these blue channels that we show within these little divots, what are these little divots here called again? They're called calveoli. Calveoli. They're little divots. They're basically, um, similar to the T-tubules, which is in skeletal muscle, we said, right? Now, these voltage-gated calcium channels are gonna open, right? And they're gonna open whenever that actual slow, these little leaky calcium channels causes it to hit. Let's say that they hit threshold potential. If they hit threshold potential, that'll stimulate these voltage-gated calcium channels. The voltage-gated calcium channels will open. If the voltage-gated calcium channels open, calcium will start flooding in extremely fast. So this would be a fast flow of calcium. And what will happen to the inside of the membrane? It'll become extremely positively charged, right? And when it becomes extremely positively charged, what's that gonna do? It's gonna cause the actual, a lot of different things to happen. Specifically, as the calcium starts flowing in, the membrane potential will flow really, really high. Let's say it reaches a point here of about positive 30 millivolts, and then it will go back down. What will cause this spike potential to go back down? It'll be due to the potassium ions leaking out of the cell, but especially, more specifically, these voltage-gated potassium channels. There's going to be these voltage gators, which are kind of like these calcium-sensitive potassium channels, and potassium will start leaking out, making, side, making the inside of the membrane more negative to relax. Okay, but it'll occur very rapidly. And again, if that was that one and it still is at the threshold, another spike potential will occur. If it's still a threshold, it'll hit another spike potential. So in other words, watch this. Let's say by some situation, we have some other stimulation factors, and that's what we're going to talk about here. Let's say by some situation, we have those leaky calcium channels, but then we blow past the threshold potential. Like what? What could actually cause it to go even more than the threshold potential? You know there's certain types of chemical factors? So in certain situations, especially in smooth muscle, protons have the ability to act on smooth muscle. Oxygen has the ability to act on smooth muscle. CO2 has the ability to act on smooth muscle. And depending upon their levels, they could either stimulate or inhibit the smooth muscle to contract. So this could stimulate the smooth muscle contraction, or they can inhibit the smooth muscle contraction. What else? You know, our nervous system. I said that our nervous system, let's say that for some situation here, you're releasing acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is for the most part in our actual smooth muscle, generally, depending upon what organ, in this case we can say that this is a smooth muscle cell of the stomach. If it is, acetylcholine would love to stimulate this one by acting on what's called muscarinic type 3 receptors. Yeah. But at the same time, we can have other parts of the nervous system come over here. And if that was that case, let's say that it released noroepinephrine. Noroepinephrine would want to inhibit this actual smooth muscle via certain types of adrenergic receptors. Okay. Now, if this were to happen, that could also affect it. You know what else can also affect it too? Besides these chemical factors, besides these neurotransmitters, so what would these be due to? This would be due to neurotransmitters. There's other things that can affect it also. Hormones. So let's say I have another receptor here. 
another receptor, hormones, can also directly affect this. Like what type of hormones? They can either stimulate or they can inhibit. It depends on which hormone it is. Could be hormones like uh, cholecystokinin. It could be hormones such as histamines. It could be hormones like gastrin. There could be many, many different hormones, but hormones have the ability to either stimulate or inhibit this actual smooth muscle. In other words, cause it to contract or to relax. How would it cause it to relax? It would basically inhibit the threshold potential. It would cause negative ions to flow into the cell or positive ions to come out of the cell. How would it stimulate it? It would cause cations to flow into the cell. So if you wanted to stimulate this, you'd want positive ions to flow into the cell. If you'd want to inhibit this, you'd want uh, uh, specifically the positive ions to leave the cell because this would cause the inside of the cell to become very negative. If positive ions are coming in, this would cause the inside of the cell to become very positive and it will approach threshold potential or even break the threshold potential. Same thing with all these other guys. But now, let's talk about the most important thing, which is the actual uh, nervous system. So let's say these are the neurotransmitters, right, from what? Our nervous system. Let's say that you want to contract the smooth muscle. So let's say that we have this acetylcholine acting here. Acetylcholine will activate this muscarinic type 3 receptor. When it does, it'll activate what's called a G Q protein. When it activates this GQ, it'll activate another protein which is called, I'm sorry, uh, it'll activate an enzyme called phospholipase C. And phospholipase C is really special because what he'll do is he'll degrade two different chemicals. One chemical he'll degrade is actually going to be, he'll degrade what's called PIP2, which stands for phosphoinocytyl diphosphate. What he'll do is he'll break this actual chemical up into two components. One of the components is actually going to be inocytyl triphosphate, IP3. The other one is going to be called DAG, which is diacylglycerol. This will go on to activate what's called protein kinase C, which can go and phosphorylate many different types of enzymes and proteins. But this is the important bugger right here. IP3 has specialized channels on this blue structure here. What is this blue structure here called? This is called the sarco plasmic reticulum. We already know that this is a calcium storage factory. And inside of this sarcoplasmic reticulum, we know that we're going to have a lot of calcium ions. But what else do we say was special about the sarcoplasmic reticulum besides having a lot of calcium ions? Remember we had these specialized proteins that were holding on to the calcium ions? Remember these suckers right here that were holding on to them? Like the cal sequestrin and the cal reticulin? So you're also going to have these proteins, which again is the cal sequestrin. Let's draw a green one here. And this green one here could be the cal reticulin. And these proteins are basically concentrating the calcium inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And again, what are these proteins? Let's say that this is called cal reticulin. And let's say that this red one right here is actually going to be called cal sequestrin. Cal sequestrin. What happens is when this IP3 comes over here, it binds onto this IP3 receptor and it stimulates this IP3 receptor and causes the calcium ions to flood out. And this increases the calcium ions in the cell. What else increases the calcium ions in the cell? Well, we already said it could be due to these leaky calcium channels, right? The calcium will flow in a little bit, it'll activate, thresh, bring it to threshold potential and cause this voltage-gated calcium channels to open and cause calcium to come in. So this will also increase the actual cellular calcium levels. So how many ways have we increased calcium levels? One way is going to be through these voltage-gated calcium channels on the actual membrane. What could open these? These leaky calcium channels could maybe hit threshold potential, or we could have other things influencing and bringing this actual slow waves above threshold potential, like what? Like hormones, like certain chemicals, like neurotransmitters, or a big, big one. This is huge, stretch. Stretch also stimulates these leaky calcium channels. If I stretch the smooth muscle, it stretches out these calcium channels. If I stretch out these calcium channels a little bit more, it's gonna make the channel a little bit bigger. And guess what's gonna flow in more? You're gonna have a little bit more calcium flowing in. If a little bit more calcium flows in, what's gonna to happen to the membrane potential? It can make it more positive. If it makes it more positive, won't it stimulate threshold potential? Yes, and that'll cause these voltage-gated calcium channels to open and calcium will rush in. So one way that we got the calcium in was through these voltage-gated calcium channels. 
A second way is we did it through a, a second messenger system. So the second way was through the second messenger system, which could be due to hormones also. Remember, hormones can also trigger this process too, to increase the calcium levels by certain mechanisms. Okay, primarily through this IP3 mechanism. There's another way we can get calcium in. You know, whenever our calcium levels, let's say that we're pulling a lot of this calcium out of the um, sarcoplasmic reticulum. As the calcium levels inside of the actual sarcoplasmic reticulum starts depleting, then what happens is our sarcoplasmic reticulum makes a very interesting protein. Look at this protein here. It expresses this protein, and this protein comes up to the membrane. And it's like basically kind of like coming up to the membrane and saying to the membrane, hey, I need some guys over here. Uh, he calls a guy named O-Ray. He's like, hey, O-Ray, come here, buddy. And what happens is this O-Ray protein, these tetramers, what are these things called? They're called O-Ray tetramers. They're basically these what's called store-operated um, calcium channels, stocks. And what happens is these O-ray molecules start binding to this black protein. And I'll tell you what this black protein is in just a second. And what happens is as they start binding, this black protein is actually called stim. It's a stim protein. Okay, it's called stim. And this one right here, these actual proteins are called O-ray proteins. Okay? What happens is whenever the calcium levels are depleted, it stimulates stim. And STEM stimulates the O-ray tetramers to aggregate. And guess what happens? It opens up the extracellular uh, fluid into the intracellular fluid. And calcium starts rushing in. When calcium rushes in, he's inside of the cell now. How do we get him in back into the SR to control the actual levels? There are specialized channels right here. These specialized channels will actually bring the sodium ions out and bring the calcium ions in. And there's also proton channels too. So you know there's other ones here too which can actually bring protons out and bring the calcium in. But this step requires ATP. Remember that, right? All right, so either way, we got the calcium inside of the cell. And it could be due to the actual pacemaker activity, or it could be due to hormones, it could be due to chemical factors, it could be due to neurotransmitters, it could be due to stretching of the leaky calcium channels. But either way, we can get it in through the voltage-gated calcium channels, we can get it in through the store-operated calcium channels via the O-ray tetramers in the stem, or we can get it in through the IP3 receptors via hormones or neurons. Okay, um, hormones or neurotransmitters. So this was the third way. Okay, now, once this calcium is in, that was the overall thing that the calcium levels were rising. Let's say that over here. So the overall effect was the calcium levels were rising inside of the cell. That's awesome, because you want to know why people be like, oh, doesn't it just go and buy on troponin? There is no troponin, I'm sorry, there is no troponin, yes. There's no troponin inside of the actual smooth muscle. Instead, there's another molecule. This other molecule is called calmodulin. So there's another molecule called calmodulin. And what happens is, these calcium molecules are gonna come over and they're gonna bind onto calmodulin. And when they bind onto the calmodulin, you form this thing called a calcium calmodulin complex. So I'm gonna call it the calcium cam complex. Why is this important? A couple reasons. On the actual, let's do this in an orange, on this actual thin filament, remember we said that there was a protein here, and this protein was called tropomyosin, that orange protein. That orange protein there is called tropomyosin. Okay, well that's cool, but guess what else is there? There's another protein, and this protein is sitting on the actual tropomyosin and the actual actin. What is this protein called? This protein is called calponin. There's another protein and this protein is actually going to be over here by the myosin. And this protein is actually going to be having its foot right here on the myosin as well as a foot near the actin. And this guy is called caldesmin. Generally what these proteins are doing is, if you guys remember um, from the, the actual skeletal muscle videos, we have the myosin right here, right? And on the myosin head, it has an enzyme here. And that was called a ATPase. And it was responsible for cutting ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. That's what it was responsible for. 
Well, generally what calponin and what caldesmin are doing is calponin is actually inhibiting this ATPase activity. Caldesmin is inhibiting this ATPase activity. They're also hindering the interaction between myosin and actin. Well, guess what calcium calmodulin complex does? The calcium calmodulin complex comes over here and inhibits the calponin and inhibits the caldesmin. When you inhibit these guys, they no longer will be able to inhibit the myosin ATPase activity and they'll no longer be able to hinder the actual myosin actin interaction. And so what will happen? The tropomyosin will then move out of the way. So let's show that the tropomyosin is moved out of the way and then calponin is out of the way and caldesmin is out of the way. Another thing happens, unfortunately, right? It's always something else. So calmodulin, the calcium calmodulin complex will do another thing. They'll come over here and they'll activate this enzyme. This enzyme is called myosin light chain kinase. This myosin light chain kinase is really special. So what will happen is the calmodulin calcium complex will come over here and stimulate this myosin light chain kinase. What the myosin light chain kinase will do is it'll add a phosphate onto the actual myosin heads. I'm sorry, not, not the heads, the neck. You guys remember on this actual myosin structure here, if I redraw it again, let's say I redraw this again, here you're actually going to have the head, here you'll have the neck, and here you'll have the tail, right? What happens is we're going to add a phosphate onto the neck, specifically on what's called the regulatory light chain. So the regulatory light chain. So if we add these phosphates onto the regulatory light chain on the neck of the actual myosin, what it's going to do is this will stimulate that myosin ATPase activity. If the myosin ATPase activity is activated, it'll break down ATP into ADP and into an inorganic phosphate. So again, what happens? The myosin light chain kinase comes over and phosphorylates the regulatory light chain on the neck of the myosin, which activates the myosin ATPase activity to cut the ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. Now, let's show that. So that's happened now. So it phosphorylates this bad boy, this bad boy, this bad boy, this bad boy. Sweet deal. Now that we phosphorylated it, this activates that myosin ATPase activity. Now generally, what happens is the myosin is normally bound to ATP, which helps it to be able to detach the myosin. So let's assume that it's detached right now. And then on top of that, we have this phosphate bound here to the actual regulatory light chain. Once this happens, it activates what? It activates the ATPase enzyme. When it activates the ATPase enzyme, what does it do? It cleaves the ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. So what is this first step here? The first step is ATP, well, we could actually say this is the second step, technically, ATP hydrolysis. Because the first step was this actual phosphorylation of regulatory light chain on the myosin. Then we hydrolyze the ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. So now look here. I'll have ADP and inorganic phosphate. Same thing, ADP, inorganic phosphate. ADP, inorganic phosphate, ADP, inorganic phosphate. And still, what is it bound to? It's bound to a phosphate here on the neck, on the neck, on the neck. Then, remember what happens when you have ATP. Remember, here's my hand is the actin, my head is the myosin. Generally, I'm attached to the actin. But whenever ATP binds, the myosin detaches. Whenever I hydrolyze the ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate, it goes into the cock position and then reattaches to the next actin. So pretend I bring my hand here and this is the next actin. Then it's attached. What will it do? It'll release the ADP, which will generate the power stroke, right? So what's this next thing to happen? The third thing to happen is we have to release the ADP because right now it's in the cock position. It's in the cock position. We release the ATP and this generates the power stroke, right? And that was the thing I told you, where if I was the, my hand is the actin, my head is the myosin, I'm attached here, ATP binds, I detach. Hydrolyze the ATP, I go in the cock position, reattach. Release the ADP, I then create the power stroke. Then what do I do? Bind ATP, detach, hydrolyze it, 
go into the cock position, reattach the next one. Release the ADP, power stroke. And it's just gonna keep happening and happening and happening until we actually cause those myofilaments to slide over one another. Then what happens is, what is it left with? It's left with an inorganic phosphate. But it's also still bound to this phosphate on that regulatory light chain. Then what are we gonna do? We're gonna get rid of the next thing, which is gonna get rid of the, we're gonna get rid of that actual, oop. Now let me rephrase this here. We actually don't release ADP, we release the phosphate. I'm sorry, we release the phosphate. So we should still have ADP bound afterwards. So what should we actually have bound here? We shouldn't have the inorganic phosphates bound, we should have the ADP still bound, okay? Sorry about that. So again, actin is right here, myosin is the head. If I'm attached, I wanna bind ATP, I detach. If I wanna cock it, I hydrolyze it. Now I have ADP and inorganic phosphate, and then I'm gonna reattach. Then I release the phosphate, power stroke. Then what I do, I get rid of the ADP and rebind an ATP, I detach. Hydrolyze it, cock position, reattach, and it keeps happening. So now I release the inorganic phosphate, I have the ADP left over. I'm going to get rid of the ADP and bring in a new ATP, okay? So now I'm going to release the ADP and bring in a new ATP. If I do that, now look what happens. I'm gonna have the ATP right here. If I have the ATP right here, the inorganic phosphate is still stuck there. So it'll just keep happening. It'll just keep going and doing this process. What if I wanna stop? What if I wanna relax the smooth muscle? Guess who comes to the rescue? There's another enzyme, which is called myosin light chain phosphatase. And this myosin light chain phosphatase, what he's going to do is he's gonna come over here and he's gonna remove those phosphates. He's gonna get those phosphates off. If he gets those phosphates off, then the actual myosin ATPase activity will be inhibited. So now the myosin ATPase activity will be inhibited because you're no longer gonna have these phosphates there. So this ATPase activity will be inhibited. Then guess what else is gonna happen? The calcium that's bound to the calmodulin is like, dude, I gotta go back to sarcoplasmic reticulum's calling me home, buddy. So guess what he does? The calcium's like, frick this crap, I'm out. And the calcium leaves and goes back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum via these calcium sodium exchangers, so they call them the circa, or through these actual calcium ATPases. So either way, it's getting back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. If that happens, what happens to the cam calcium complex? It decreases. What happens to the calponin inhibition? That goes away. What happens to the myosin light chain kinase activity? That goes away, so this is going to be inhibited. This will now be stimulated to go back into action. So now the calponin will be stimulated to go back into action. The caldesmin will no longer be inhibited, so he'll be stimulated to go back into action. And then it'll inhibit the myosin ATPase activity. If you inhibit the myosin ATPase activity, then it's no longer gonna continue to break down the actual ATP. Then what happens? The tropomyosin goes back to his normal position, blocking the myosin from binding to the actin. But that's not it. Some of this calcium can also get out of the cell too. Do you know there's actually specialized channels on the cell membrane too? And these channels are actually bringing the calcium out here. And this could be bringing a proton in. You also could have other channels which are bringing the calcium out of the cell and bringing some of the sodium ions into the cell. And that can also happen. But we're basically trying to get the calcium out of the cell or back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. As it does that, Another thing happens. Remember those voltage sensitive potassium channels? Those voltage sensitive potassium channels also open and potassium starts leaking out of the cell. As the potassium starts leaking out of the cell, the positive ions start leaving the cell, right? As the positive ions start leaving the cell, what happens to the inside of the cell? It becomes negative. As it becomes really, really negative, then what happens? The cell starts relaxing. And then what would happen, what would it show here on this? So if we were to kind of correlate this now, this last part here in this actual graph, we would say this. I say for whatever reason, we hit, uh, went over threshold potential. We have this spike part. And then what happens? We have the relaxation period. But then let's say that we're still here at the actual, above the actual threshold, what will happen? There'll be another spike potential. 
but then the cell has to relax. So what will happen? Potassium ions will leave and calcium ions will go back into the smooth endoplasmic sarcoplasmic reticulum. Let's say it's still at threshold. What will happen? And it'll have another spike due to the calcium entry from whatever the three ways. And then what happens? The actual repolarization phase due to the potassium leaving or calcium going back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum occurs. <sighs> All right, engineers, we covered a lot of information in this video about smooth muscle, the types of smooth muscle, how it's not striated. We went over its microscopic anatomy. We went over its neural control, its hormonal control, the chemical factors. We went over the entire contraction and relaxation mechanism. I really hope this made sense. I hope you guys did enjoy it. If you did, please hit the like button, comment down in the comment section, and as always, please subscribe. All right, engineers, until next time.